the wounds of the Great War were slow to heal. In the post-war chaos, the Zeppelin Company had barely survived. When the Locarno Treaties lifted restrictions on German aviation in 1926, Hugo Eckener, the tireless airship promoter, raised money to build the largest airship possible in one of the few hangars the Allies had permitted to remain. The new rigid design overcame the problem of consuming fuel weight during flight by employing a gaseous fuel mixture called blau gas. The new airship would fly for a week and still not have to valve lifting gas making very long distance journeys practical. The completed LZ-127 was christened the Graf Zeppelin in July 1928. The Graf made a flight across to America that October, but not without peril. Stormy weather on the route had torn the fabric away from the port horizontal stabilizer, and the airshipmen had to conduct daring repairs in flight. Americans were caught up in the drama and the Graf's progress was carefully tracked until it arrived safely at Lakehurst. Docked next to its smaller sister, LZ-126, the Finn's fabric was replaced. Washington had been slow to replace the lost Shenandoah. Finally, a Navy contract for twin six and a half million cubic foot airships was signed with the Goodyear Zeppelin Company. The new design envisioned carrying a small number of airplanes. The dirigibles would become flying aircraft carriers. Ironically, the first aircraft carrying vessels had been built to allow airplanes to fight off zeppelins, shadowing the British fleet. But there were many problems trying to marry the airplane to the steel ship. There had been several experiments carrying a defensive fighter to be dropped from an airship. The U.S. Army was the first to successfully fly an airplane to hook on to an airship. The flying aircraft carrier was conceived as the ultimate naval scout. To test the concept, the Navy equipped an old Vought U-01 with a propeller guard and a latching hook at its center of gravity. The Los Angeles flew a straight course and maneuvering tests were promising. Next. Lakehurst engineers installed a retractable ladder-like trapeze on the Los Angeles in December 1928. Refinements to the trapeze and adjustments to the trim of the airship were carried out in the hangar. On July 3, 1929, the first test flights were made, but the airplane could not latch on. The mechanism was reworked, and on August 20th, Lieutenant Jake Gordon made the first hook-on to the trapeze. Leaving Lakehurst, the Los Angeles and her hook-on act were a hit at the 1929 National Air Races held in Cleveland, Ohio. Gorton flew the Vought up to hook-on. Lieutenant Calvin Bolster climbed in, and the airplane returned to the ground. There was no longer any doubt the airplane idea could work. Later that year, the Graf Zeppelin would grab headlines as William Randolph Hearst sponsored an airship voyage around the world. The Graf first had to fly back to Lakehurst. There, U.S. Navy observers, as well as reporter Lady Grace Drummond Hay, joined the select group of passengers. The journey's first official leg was back to Friedrichshafen, and after replenishment, the Graf set out over Europe and Russia. The trackless expanse of Siberia was inhospitable, but Graf forged ahead, setting distance and duration records before arriving safely near Tokyo, Japan. After docking in the former Zeppelin hangar obtained by Japan following the Great War, Graf set out across the vast Pacific. Sailing over the Golden Gate, Graf made way down the coast for a mast erected by the U.S. Navy in Los Angeles. Topping off her hydrogen too soon, some gas escaped in the midday heat. Later, Graf could not rise above a temperature inversion and attempted a dynamic liftoff that nearly ended in disaster on power lines. Only skillful handling of the airship got the Graf across the continent and into Lakehurst, damaged tail and all. 
The Navy officers took this experience to mean that they should be able to see the lower fin from the bridge. They worked to have a change made in the new rigid airship, then being built in Akron, Ohio. Graf was repaired and flew back to Germany. It began a long career of making regular runs from Germany to South America, as well as visits to many parts of the world. Attention. Back in Lakehurst, Lieutenant Commander Herbert V. Wiley relieved Rosendahl on the 9th of May as Wiley took command of the USS Los Angeles. It's an order. Navy Department, Bureau of Navigation, Washington, D.C., 2 May 1929. From Bureau of Navigation to Lieutenant Commander C. Rosendahl, USN, commanding USS Los Angeles. Subject change of duty. You are hereby detached from duty in command of the USS Los Angeles and from such other duty as may have been assigned you. We'll report by letter to the Commandant, 4th Day Naval District, for duty involving flying as Commander, Rigid Airship Training and Experimental Squadron, USS Los Angeles. Signed, R.H. Lee. Navy Department, Bureau of Navigation, Washington, D.C., 2 May, 1929. Farm Bureau of Navigation, 2 Lieutenant Commander, H.V. Wiley, USN. Subject to duty in command of USS Los Angeles. You will report to the commander, Rigid Airship Training and Experimental Squadron, USS Los Angeles, for duty involving flying in command of the USS Los Angeles. Signed, R.H. Lee. Hello, oh, Lee. Very good, sir. My congratulations on the new command. Thank you, Commodore. I hope we do as well as you have. Prepare for inspection. Right. Open ranks! The airshipmen foresaw Fire. the need to carry a simple glider to land an airship officer on the ground perhaps serving to organize a handling party. Lieutenant Ralph Barnaby was chosen to fly the German Prufling glider on January 31, 1930. The airship slowed down for him to climb down the ladder, then sped up to 40 knots when he was safely in the seat. A lanyard released the glider and Barnaby dropped her fast to avoid the lower engine's propeller. The achievement made front page of the New York Times on the 1st of February, 1930. Lieutenant Tex Settle repeated the feat on the 4th of July, but the glider's wing was damaged and these demonstrations ended. England regained the headlines with two new giant passenger airships. The privately built R-100 completed its series of local test flights in January 1930. She then carried a dozen people in luxury across the Atlantic. Despite damage to the outer cover, it moored safely to the tower mast in Montreal on July 31st. Following cover repairs and some local flying, the R-100 carried its passengers home to England. Not to be outdone, the R-101 emerged from a lengthening operation, sporting many improvements. Embarrassed by the cost overruns and delays, the government minister for air, Lord Thomason, pushed for a flight to India before adequate testing was possible. The last minute addition of nine more tons of diesel fuel hastened her destruction when R-101 hit the ground and caught fire in France. October 5th, 1930. The LTA empire of the air ended after the R-100 was broken up for scrap. The Americans were confident their plans for naval airships were sound. Los Angeles was finally released from its civilian restrictions to become a naval scout. A hook-on demonstration was included in President Hoover's Fleet Review of 1930. The OU-1 took off from a flat top and flew up to hook on to the Los Angeles, flying overhead. Remote broadcasting was all the rage and radio audiences thrilled to hear Lieutenant Commander Charles Nicholson talk about the art of hook-on flying. With the new ships coming, the Bureau of Aeronautics ordered several N2Y trainers to the Naval Aircraft Factory to be equipped with skyhooks. Still Pensacola Yellow, 
The little five-cylinder airplanes were successfully tested on the Los Angeles trapeze. Even the hot new aluminum-bodied fighter, the XF-9C-1, would have its turn on the skyhook. And the Navy decided to buy Curtis Sparrowhawks to defend the new ships. In the meantime, officers suggested the Los Angeles keel be equipped with an airplane monorail handling system. But as the depression deepened, the cost-conscious Navy abandoned the work. The trapeze would be removed. The ZR-3's longest deployment came in February of 1931, when it participated in fleet problems in the Caribbean and Pacific. The airship tender Potoka dutifully provided support during the exercise. Moorings were conducted in the Gulf of Panama and Dolce Bay, Costa Rica. Los Angeles also rode the mast circle at Guantanamo, Cuba. She was away from Lakehurst for 27 days and traveled a total of 14,500 miles. That autumn, the new ZRS-4, USS Akron, arrived at Lakehurst to be squeezed into Hangar 1 next to the old German ship. On November 2nd, 1931, the Los Angeles overflew New York City with the Akron. The only time two helium-filled rigid airships appeared together in flight. There was finally enough helium, but not enough money for two rigid airships. The Los Angeles was relegated to training flights and defaced with patterns and camouflage colors. After seven years and five months of operation, the old airship made her last flight. Commander Fred Barry, her last skipper, officially decommissioned USS Los Angeles on June 30th, 1932. A total of 331 flights had been made. ZR-3 had spent more than 4,000 hours in the air. USS Los Angeles was supposed to remain in readiness on 30 days notice. In December 1934, after the USS Akron was gone, ZR-3 was again inflated with helium, loaded with fuel and ballast, and undocked for a testing of mooring equipment. As the Los Angeles became part of the Lakehurst landscape, personnel attempted to authorize a recommissioning during the three years of tests. The old girl was docked for the last time on November 18, 1937. The USS Los Angeles was formally stricken from records on October 24, 1939. In September, the scrapping operation started under test conditions that showed the structure's strength had not been significantly diminished in its 15 years. By January 1940, the disassembled duraluminum framing was sold for scrap. Her well-traveled sister, Graf Zeppelin, had become quite the globetrotter with visits to Moscow, Rome, Spain, and Egypt. When her more famous sister burned in 1937, the German government built the ultimate rigid airship, the LZ-130. But with war again darkening Europe, both Graf Zeppelins were turned into tourist attractions, then cut up for scrap. On July 2nd, 2000, exactly 100 years to the day Count Zeppelin's first machine took to the skies above the Bodensee, the Zeppelin New Technology semi-rigid airship was christened the Friedrichshafen by the Count's granddaughter. The NT's production is opening a new era of buoyant flight, which may also see huge semi-rigid cargo-carrying dirigibles. Giant airships will again fly the skies of America.